Uh, welcome to MEC at Home, from our home to your home. Uh, I'm Eric. And I'm Fee. Um, isn't it really exciting to see the uh, restrictions being lifted? Uh, we were down at the park yesterday with our kids, um, being able to go down and have a play. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to um, getting back to my outdoor fitness classes. Uh, yeah, we're also really looking forward to seeing you face to face again when that's possible. Uh, and when that happens, as a church, we'll enter a COVID safe season. Uh, but we all experience various seasons in life, don't we? We do. Um, some of them can be really tough and some of them can be really full of joy. Uh, and even though this is strange days for us, um, it isn't a new season um, for humanity. Times like these have happened before and God's yeah. people have really shone. Uh, they've really endured through these seasons uh, and really shown um, the community around them um, that light. So even though it feels like we're going through this weird coronavirus thing as a whole globe, uh, each of us watching today uh, is going to be going through our own season in life, uh, which are very varied. Uh, so no matter what season God has placed you in at this time, uh, one of the great joys is that we can be united in Christ together. Mm. So today we're going to sing, pray, and hear from God's Word. Uh, be sure to stick around um, at the end to hear how um, we can keep connecting through this time of isolation.
Hello, I'm Ruth. I'm a long-term member of MEC and I'm part of the Night Church congregation. I'm going to lead us in praying today. This week we are particularly praying for the country of Azerbaijan, a former Soviet Republic located on the Caspian Sea, just north of Iran. Officially, Azerbaijan is a secular country with religious freedom, but the population is overwhelmingly Muslim and Christians are often under surveillance. The law is used to justify fines, police raids, detentions and imprisonments. Spies are sent to church gatherings and Christians find it hard to know who to trust. Compulsory re-registration laws have meant that many churches have lost their registration and are now targets for the authorities. However, despite the restrictions, there are reports of growth in the church there, with many people wanting to be baptised. So please join with me as we talk together to our great God. Heavenly Father, you are the creator of everything, seen and unseen, in heaven and on earth. The creation we see shows only a shadow of your awesomeness and splendour. You stretched out the heavens like a tent. You set the earth on its foundations. You covered it with water. When you roared, the water retreated and mountains rose up. You provide water to drink and food to eat. If you turn your back on creation, it will be destroyed. If you take your breath from us, we will die. How can we show the reverence and fear that is rightfully yours? How can we praise you as you deserve? How amazing then that Jesus, who is God, the Son, who is the word that brought creation into being, has humbled himself to be human, to be despised among humanity, to take on all that is most despicable in us and die for our sakes. Thank you that because of what Jesus has done, you treat us as if we are just as clean and good as him. It is only because of Jesus that we can call you Father and can talk to you in prayer. Thank you. We know you can accomplish everything you want to without us. It's a great privilege and mystery that you invite us to bring our concerns to you and allow us to be partners in your plan for our world. As we bring our requests and petitions to you, Father, we want to bend to your will as you provide answers and solutions that are perfect, so much wiser than we can imagine or ask for. Thank you for the reminders in Ecclesiastes that you give us so many good gifts and also for the warnings that these gifts will only ever have eternal meaning and value if we enjoy them with you in the way you have designed, trusting you to show us what true wisdom is. Psalm, tell, Psalm 10 tells us that it is the wicked man who boasts about the cravings of his heart. In his pride, he does not seek the Lord. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. He says to himself, nothing will ever shake me. No one will ever do me harm. Oh Lord, COVID-19 has shown so clearly how foolish it is for us to trust in ourselves and each other. We pray that the severe lessons of this time will not be lost on us or forgotten in the future. In your mercy, please help us to use this time to readjust our perspective, to reflect more truly our utter dependence on you. Please help us to hold more lightly to the things we have thought were necessary for comfort and to value more deeply the things we have taken for granted. Thank you for the reassurance found in every part of your word that nothing at all can take away the joy of belonging to you. Please make this more real than ever for us, not only now, but also in the future when it may again be easier to find temporary joy in other things. Father, we pray this not just for ourselves, but for all of your world. We think especially of the many countries where the loss of life has been enormous. 
Lord, we pray that this demonstration of human helplessness would push many to look beyond themselves and reach gratefully for the salvation and perfect sovereignty you offer. We pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, that you would draw them closer to you in this time and would give them courage to take new opportunities to speak about you. We do pray that the example of Christ, who didn't grasp his rights but humbled himself as a servant, would be a great encouragement for your people at this time to put aside their rights and humbly serve others. In particular, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Azerbaijan. Thank you that even in such harsh conditions, your word continues to have the power to save and encourage your people. We ask that there would be unity among the different Christian denominations within Azerbaijan. We ask that they would have the wisdom and humility to put aside differences to work together for your glory. Please be with those who are being disadvantaged and overlooked in their workplaces because of their faith. Please encourage them to shine as stars as they serve you wherever you have placed them. Lord, as we ourselves navigate very different ways of being a community of believers, please help us to demonstrate the same love and grace that you have shown us. Please make your spirit active in us to see better how to serve each other with forgiveness and humility, with each member using their gifts for the good of the whole body. Please pour out your mercy on those who are ill or frail or struggling with loss of work or income. We ask that as they, the need for facilities for our MEC activities is recessed, you would lead us in the way we should go. Please give us wisdom and insight and help those who will be making decisions about the short and long-term future to be open to new opportunities. Please help us to put aside our own comfort in familiarity and to see what your will really is. Lord, above all else, we pray that your name would be glorified throughout our world. Please prepare us to be ready for the day when your glory is revealed when every knee will bow to you as ruler above all rulers and every tongue will confess that you are truly Lord of all. Amen. Uh, hey everybody, uh, my name is Ethan, I attend the 10.30 service um, and I'll be doing the Bible reading today. It's from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, um, verse 1 to 22, so the whole chapter. So here we go. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to rebuild. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden of I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Whatever is has been already done, what, it, what is has already been and what will be here has been before and God will call the past to account. And I saw something else under the sun. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. I said to myself, 
God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. I also said to myself, as for humans, God tests them so that they may see they are like the animals. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward, and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work, because that is their lot. For who can bring themselves for who can bring them to see what will happen after them? The Pixar movie Up has one of the most extraordinary openings to a film ever. It's a montage focused on Carl and Ellie, an ordinary everyday couple. As they as they court and get married in a church, then they work and settle into a home and then they've got hopes of a child which are dashed through a miscarriage and then got hopes of adventure which are dashed as well when sadly Ellie dies and the, the movie fades or this montage fades to a funeral at the end in the church where they were married. At one level it's so sad you wonder why anyone would watch it but at another level it's so compelling that you can't not watch it. The movie is in the top five ever Pixar films. And this opening scene is viewed as a cultural milestone. It stands as a beacon of honest realism against a backdrop of pretense and denial that often comes out of Hollywood. Ecclesiastes is a bit like the movie Up. It's honest and real. Yes, it's hard to read at times, but it draws us in. One of my teachers, Barry Webb, describes it as a pair of overalls. Listen to what he says. It's for those who are done with pretense and triumphalism and just want to get on with life, with the contentment and confidence of knowing that our times are in God's hands. Now this is a lot easier said than done, isn't it? Even today, some of us are a long way from contentment. Some of us perhaps are in a season of sickness and it just seems to go on and on and it's very unsettling. Maybe you've taken a financial hit through COVID-19 and you've had to make changes to your plans and perhaps radical ones even. Maybe you're working through difficulties in a relationship at home or in the wider family or at work or at school and it's, it's quite messy and, uh, and anxious for you. Well, perhaps there's that low level disappointment that we all feel from time to time when we realise that life isn't working out the way we thought it would. Quick recap, Ecclesiastes is the, contains the words of the teacher, an ancient wise man. His thesis is that everything is hevel, mist, vapour, smoke. And he's on a search for something that lasts and he takes us right to the boundary of life and he pulls things apart and sometimes he doesn't put them back together quick, as quickly as we'd like. He shakes us up. Now, I've got to say, as a preacher, Ecclesiastes is very hard to preach because I want to make things cl as clear and simple as possible and I'd like to resolve things, you know, but there's no quick, clear answers in Ecclesiastes. So I must resist the urge and let his voice be heard. Three points today. Firstly, the times of God. Have a look at verse 1. There is a time for everything, a season for every activity under heaven. And then we get this list of 28 seasons in 14 couplets. The first thing you notice is that the times of our lives are determined by God, not us. The key is the first couplet, a time to be born and a time to die. Now, assuming you're watching this on May the 17th, Sunday, it's, uh, it's 50 years to the day that I was born. Hilson Hospital, 3.14 a.m., now that wasn't my timing, and it certainly wasn't mum's, she assures me. God decided that was my time to enter the world, and he will decide when it's my time to leave. Just as God determines the seasons of creation, spring, summer, autumn, winter, so he determines the seasons of our lives, planting, uprooting, mourning, dancing, weeping, laughing. That's why, secondly, 
There's a time for everything, not just some things. Have a look again at verse 1. There's a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens. See, if I was in control, I'd only choose some things, the good things. Planting, healing, building, laughing, we all love those things. But the world doesn't dance to the beat of our comfort drum. What did God say to Adam in the Garden of Eden after the fall? Genesis 3, through painful toil you'll eat your food until you return to the ground. From the moment we determined to turn our back on God, God determined that we would die. There's a time to die. And even before that time, death pokes its ugly head up through life. Uprooting, killing, tearing down, weeping, mourning, pictures of war perhaps. Who knows? I don't think we're meant to pin everything down here. It's the overall effect that matters. A time, 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 and none of them determined by us. All from God's hand, whether we're ready or not, whether we like it or not. I've got some pictures here of my dad through some of the seasons of his life. A young man with his family. And then a young man at work. And then his marriage to my mum. And then him as a young dad with us kids. And that was about it for dad. He came in God's time and he left in God's time. Now... There's a real challenge in all of this, as we think of this poem, from the teacher. And the challenge is we love to think that we're in control, but we're not. But there's a comfort here as well. See, half the time I walk around thinking that my life isn't working out the way it should. Well, who says it's not? Whatever's happening, it's God's time. And the rest of the time I tend to worry myself sick about what's ahead. That's God's time too. So why worry? But let's not get too comfortable. This is Ecclesiastes after all. He's pulling us apart, you see. He's shaking us up. He's making us think. That brings us to the second point, the burden of humanity. Have a look at verse 10. I've seen the burden God has laid on the human race. And what's the burden? Well, look at verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He's also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Can you feel it, friends? God has made the world a beautiful place. Remember Genesis 1, it was good, it was good, it was good. And we can see God's beautiful fingerprints all around us. And more than that, he's given us a sense of forever in our hearts. And yet, we don't really know what God's up to in the detail of everyday life. You see, the teacher knew the beginning, creation, and he knew the end, judgment. And we know more than the teacher today, we know that at the end, God will bring all things together under Jesus, and yet still the exact details are frustratingly scarce. Someone asked John Lennox, the Oxford maths professor, what God's up to through COVID-19. And he said something like, I don't know, maybe he will fill the church, maybe he will empty the church. I mean, it'd be great to know which one, wouldn't it? It'd help with planning. What's God doing in your life right now? What's he doing in my life? We know the big story. He's shaping us into the likeness of Jesus. But we can't fathom the detail. And it's a burden. We see his fingerprints in creation. We sense his presence in our hearts. But the daily detail is often a burdensome blur. Why does he do this, friends? Well, have a look at verse 14. The last bit. God does it so that people will fear him. See that? He deliberately withholds the details in order to humble us, 
to remind us of our place, to make us dependent on him. He is big, you see. We are small. But you know, the burden is heavier still. In verse 16, we read this, And I saw something else under the sun. In place of judgment, wickedness was there. And in the place of justice, wickedness was there. And then if you go down to chapter 4, verse 1, we read, Again I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of the oppressors, and they have no comforter. See, it's not just that we don't know what will happen. The things that do happen are often horrifically unfair. It's a burden. We see beauty. We sense forever. But we live in the presence of evil, injustice and death. So what to do? Well, have a look at chapter 3, verse 12. The teacher tells us, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. Now, does that sound a bit flippant? Careless even? I want to come back to it at the end. Maybe the teacher's onto something. But he makes one more point in chapter 3. The time of God. There are times of God through life, but there's the time of God that looms largest of all. Have a look there with me at verse 17. I said to myself, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. See, if we're not humbled by the seasons or by the burden, we should certainly be humbled by our coming death and judgment. Now we've got two cats here at home, Maisie and Holly. Now this is a drawing, it'll appear on the screen hopefully, a drawing of Holly done by a young woman in our church, Gemma. What a great job she's done there. Talent. Every now and then, you know, I come home from the office and I have an imaginary conversation with the cats. Don't worry, I'm not going mad. I'm just a little bit weird. And it goes like this. What have you been doing all day, cats? And they reply, nothing as usual, just lying around in the sun. And I say, well, how boring is that? It's a short conversation. But friends, what small lives animals live. They they make no plans for great achievements, no plans for even small achievements. They never boast. Have you ever seen an animal frame and hang their credentials for all to see? They live small lives. Now here's the thing. The great big wall of our coming death and judgment makes our lives look small too. Have a look at verse 19, the second part. Humans have no advantage over the animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust and to dust all return. Did you hear that? Humans have no advantage over the animals. Now, the teacher's not denying the dignity of humans. We're all made in God's image. We've got that over the animals. But what we've got in common is that we're all small, standing against the giant reality of God's coming judgment. How are you going, friends? The teacher's taking us to the boundary, isn't he? He's pulling things apart. He's shaking us up. He's making us think. So what should we do? Well, have a look at verse 22 there with me. So I saw that there is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work because that is their lot. Now, is that an adequate response to all this deep boundary fence thinking? Well, I want to say no and yes. Firstly, it's not adequate because there is something better for us to do. And here, the Apostle Paul helps resolve something for the teacher. In Acts 17, he's talking to the people of Athens who've been ignoring God and going their own way and doing their own thing. And and he says this in chapter 17, verse 30. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. 
You see, in the light of God's coming judgment, what's the best thing to do? Repent. That word means change your mind. You see, by nature, we don't think much of Jesus as king. We think we're kings, and that we're running our own show and setting our own agenda and doing our own thing and making our own plans. And then we hear that God has raised Jesus from the dead on that Easter Sunday. And more than that, he's exalted him as king to the highest place. And even more than that, he's appointed him as judge. And all of a sudden, we change our minds. We repent and we start to honour Jesus and give him the glory that he deserves. And we start to learn how to live his way, not ours. Now, I first repented as a 16-year-old boy. I remember I was out chopping wood with my older brother. And out of the blue, he turned to me and said, Rog, do you know that the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus? He said, have you received that gift? Now, my brother didn't normally speak to me with such profound words, but for some reason he decided to at that point. And all of a sudden, at that moment, my eyes were opened to Jesus. I repented and I received the forgiveness of sins. And I've been repenting ever since because it's a daily reminder that Jesus is king, not me. In the light of God's coming judgment, what's the best thing to do? It's repent. Have you done that yet? You can do it now if you like. You can pray a prayer to God. You could start by telling him how sorry you are for ignoring Jesus and doing things your own way. We've all done it, folks. You're not alone there. And you could ask him to help you live with Jesus as king from here on. Now, if you pray that prayer, be assured God will answer you and he will forgive you and he will adopt you into his family as one of his children, his forever family, his eternal family. You will cross from death to life. You will cross from judgment to salvation. The sting of death will be removed for you. Now, if you do pray that prayer, then Tell someone who can help you grow as a Christian. Now, if you're still not sure about Jesus, that's fine. Perhaps you'd like to learn more about him. We can help you with that. Our online Christianity Explored course starts on May the 21st. Check out the MEC webpage for details, maitlandchurch.org. But for those of us who already know Jesus... Does that mean that everything makes perfect sense now? That we can sort of sail through life, hitting all our personal goals and overcoming every hurdle? Well, have a listen to the Apostle James writing to Christians 2,000 years ago. And listen out for the similarities to the teacher's words. James chapter 4, verse 13. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to this city or that, spend a year there, carry on business and make money, why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Do you hear that? Our life is a mist, smoke, vapour. We don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. See, God is big, we are small. The teacher's words still stand for the Christian today. Now there's a wonderful freedom that comes with this, folks. We don't have to try and prove ourselves to God anymore. We don't have to try and pay our own debt and overcome judgment ourselves. God, Jesus has paid it for us. He's done it for us. We can let go of boasting, friends, as if our life is all about us and our achievements. Now, none of this is easy, friends, but we can learn how to do this. God knows, friends, that we are small like the animals. Let's learn to rest in that truth 
and just get on with doing the good things that He puts in front of us each day. Things like honouring our parents, caring for the poor and needy, loving our neighbours, being faithful at work and at home and at school, bringing our kids up in the ways of Jesus, good things, persevering through whatever season God has us in right now and sharing the good news of Jesus with others, friends. And let's not underestimate the usefulness of the book of Ecclesiastes in that task. We read even in today's chapter about the beauty in creation that everyone sees and eternity in our hearts that everyone senses. You see, when we speak of God to others around about us, we are only reinforcing the voices that they already hear every day in their own hearts and minds. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the opportunity to reflect on how big you are and how small we are. Oh Lord, humble us before your mighty hand that you may lift us up in due time. And may we learn to cast all our cares upon you and humbly accept from you your hand the season which you have placed us in right now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, g'day, MEC. Rog here. I've got uh, our brother Stuart with us here and he's going to um, just share a little bit about how he's going at the moment. Uh, Stuart's part of the 1030 congregation and he's also uh, comes along at night church from time to time and uh, Stuart's got a special guest with him at the moment um, during this lockdown season. Welcome Stuart and uh, tell us about who you've got staying with you right now brother. Yeah thanks for the welcome. Yes um, my sister who, who I'm very close to uh, she came over to Australia for a holiday and now she can't get back home, so she's been here an extra three weeks already, uh, and we don't really know when she can go back. But fortunately, we get on really well together. Uh, as I say, we're very close. So no problems at all. It's nice to have company. Fantastic. And uh, Stuart, just tell us who else you've got in your, uh, in your household there and how you occupy yourself during this lockdown period. Well... Uh, all I've got in this household is me. My wife died five years ago. And I've got a dog who, who I uh, take walking three times a day uh, to keep her happy and me fit. <laughs> so, and Cherry, my sister, is here with us at the moment. Yeah. But that's it. That's us. Fantastic. Now, what do you miss most about uh, gathering together at the moment, Stuart? Yes. What, what oh, sorry, can you speak? <laughs> yeah. what do oh, you miss? sorry. No, you're right, mate. What do you miss most about gathering together at the moment? I, I really miss my church. I miss coming along to church. And, um, yeah, I, I, I love being with my brothers and sisters in, in at the church when I meet them there. And, uh, and the fact that we can talk openly about Jesus and uh, about what God has done for us. Uh, and of course we get to listen to a service and sing a, a few songs or hymns so I miss that because I live alone basically now uh, and it's good for me I love going to church so yeah and I'm missing it a bit. It's interesting you should say that because of course you've been with us for about six years but prior to that you had a I think it was a 35 year kind of absence from church. Um, tell yeah. us why did you walk away from church, Stu? Yeah, the church that uh, that I belong to, um, it split on on uh, on uh, the basis of grace or works. Uh, I tend to be a grace man myself, um, and the split really hurt me quite badly. But at the same time, we also moved home, so. Uh, I'd left a split church and moved to a whole new area. And um, we looked around for a church, my, uh, Christine and myself, and, oh, look, it would have been 10, 10 12 times we went to different churches and um, everything, you know, all, all we seemed to be going for was a flogging because mm. back then everything was works. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. And... 
you know, so in the end we thought, no, oh, I can't handle this, you know, so, so we never went anymore for a long, long time. Fortunately, um, God never let go of me, uh, although uh, there were periods when I wasn't a practicing Christian, I was in a job where I could uh, be counselling and helping people, so in a sense, um, I was still being something of a shepherd, but not like perhaps I ought to have been. And, and what was it that brought you back? Brother, what brought you back into the church? Yeah, um, a friend that um, we'd known for 40 years, um, that, well, a couple of friends, they, they go to the evangelical church on the central coast, and we'd never lost contact with them. And um, she spoke to us and said, well, why don't you try the Maitland Evangelical Church? And, and so I did. I, I, uh, I down, well, I listened to a couple of sermons on the net, and they were both grace, and I thought, oh, glory be, you know. So the following week, we went to church, and it was absolutely wonderful. It was like going home again. Mm. People were great. It was um, a fairly large congregation um well by our standards around here it's large anyway and probably more than a third of them were adults to young adults and and i've got to tell you that the preaching was was excellent it was always brought in grace which mm. i i need i need to hear grace because uh, I, I, I can get down on myself too much if i if i don't hear grace yes. so um yeah, the member, the church congregation was so good and Christine died 12 months after we joined the church and the congregation was so good. I, I was out for meals probably four nights a week and uh, people were inviting me for the day and stuff like that. It was really glorious. It was great. And I thank the Lord that uh, I ended up coming to, to that church. Fantastic. Yeah. No, that's great, brother. And just thinking, finally, you talk about God's grace. And, and how is his grace helping you right now, Stuart, in this lockdown season? Yeah, well, uh, as I say, I miss going to church. Um, I do run a, a men's Bible study, which has been going for uh, probably three years now here. And we've gone on to Zoom to continue it. And, and that's good. But because it reminds me all the time, although I do study in the morning and, and read a devotional, but it reminds me of God's grace, that, that I am forgiven, mm. uh, that even though I was an enemy, um, even then, you know, that God forgave me. Mm. And I'm reminded of John 3.16, that uh, God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son. And, uh, yeah, it's the fact of being forgiven. Mm. Um, when, when, you know, for me, I don't think I'm worthy of forgiveness, but God loves me and mm. God forgives me, and I'm thankful for that. Yeah, and that's get, that gets me through. It gets me through every day. Um, love it. Yeah, God loves me and I love him. Good on you, brother. It's a wonderful thing to catch up with you over Zoom. Look forward to seeing you face to face soon enough. And you've been a blessing to the to the congregation here this morning. So God bless you, brother. Okay, thank you. And I look forward to seeing you all in real life too. Yeah. God Fantastic. bless you. Oh, praise the name. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed Ooh. 
My name's Sophie and I'm part of the 8.30 primary team. This week in the Kids Packs, we're thinking about how even in hard situations, in the worst of times, God can provide for what we need. Is that you, Wilbur? Oh, oh, yeah, sorry, Sophie. Am I interrupting something? Yes. Well, I was just explaining to the children about how God is in control of bad situations, like the story of Elijah and the widow in the Kids Packs this week. Oh, well, that's perfect timing. Do you think God could help me in the worst possible situation that I'm in at the moment? Oh, no. What's happened? Oh, well, I saved some lollies from my lolly pack from a party I went to just before isolation and I hid them. But I can't find them anywhere. Oh, that's the worst. It's really, really bad. Well, did you know, as I've said, that God is in control of everything? Oh, how do you mean? Has God sometimes lost his lolly bags too? No, not quite like that. This week we're learning about how Elijah was in a hard situation. It was a drought and Elijah had to run away from an evil king. And then he ends up asking a widow for a meal, but she and her son are already starving. Oh, that's really bad. I mean, 
I'm hanging for those lies, but I do have a full stomach for my porridge at breakfast. Oh, Wilbur, I bet you're always hungry for lollies. And if we fast forward the Bible sto story, we can see that God is in control of even the worst thing that's ever happened. God's control was so great, and he was able to use the death of his son on the cross to provide for our greatest need to be friends with him again. Oh, when I think about it, when you explain it like that, Sophie, it's very impressive. That's right. Well, open your kids' pack and you'll be amazed to see how God uses this story to tell an even bigger picture of how he's in control with ev of everything. Oh, I can't get right to get into it. But, Sophie, could you just help me with one last thing? Mm-hmm. Help me for my lolly bag before Shh. I start the craft? Sure. Oh, great. Okay, but first we better say goodbye so the kids can get into their Sunday school packs. Oh, good idea. Bye. Bye. We trust that God's word has encouraged and challenged you today. Why don't you share with someone in your household or maybe a friend over a text um, something that you were challenged or encouraged by? Yeah. And you can also connect with others each Sunday from 11 o'clock on Zoom. Uh, and if you're new to MEC, uh, we still want to meet you. Uh, and we want to let you know about who we are. And you can do that on mecathome.org. There's a place you can fill in to find out more and we'll get in contact with you. If you've got questions or thoughts about Jesus or Christianity that you'd like answered and you'd like to explore further, we're running a Christianity Explored course online as well. And there are more information on the website too. So have a great week, stay connected and keep safe. See ya.
Uh, welcome to MSA.